any questions out there in uh, Zoom land? Um, I do remind everyone the project's due in a little over a week, so please look at it if you have not. Um, okay, we continue to try to add things to my buffer, um, mostly because, again, the whole point in the buffer, at least in a practical sense, I mean, you can accidentally have a buffer, but if you intentionally create a buffer, it's because you're trying to mitigate changes in pH, which, you know, really is only going to happen if there's some other acid or base base present separate from the acid and base combination that's making up the buffer. And so this idea of having essentially at least a third or fourth, if you count water, acid or base in the mixture is exactly how my buffer is designed to operate. Right. And so again, it's just another equilibrium problem. Right. If I have multiple acids and bases, right, the brute force approach to it always is to, you know, make a list of the acids, make a list of the bases, and make them all react with each other. Right. And then I just solve them biggest K to smallest K. That doesn't really require me to know much of anything or to make any kind of, you know, decision up front about what reactions to consider. Right. On the other hand, if I have some facility with buffers, right, the buffer reaction itself is always a weak acid or weak base Ka or Kb reaction, right? And my K neutralizations are always freaking bigger, bigger, which means they're going to go first, right? And so, you know, I can cut to the quick in terms of what the two, sometimes three reactions um, of relevance, right? But again, when in doubt, make a list of acids, make a list of bases, react every acid with every base and let the Ks sort them out, All right? Again, the biggest rule really for the entire semester is if you have a salt, which is just another word for an ionic compound, dissolved in water, it dissociates. And frankly, I would pre-dissociate any salt I have before I do any chemistry problem, right? It's only really practical because it happens, right? And so if I have a salt dissolved in water, I really don't have the salt. And as I've been saying, 99% of the time, I don't want or need or use both pieces of the salt, right? Ionic compounds have to have a positive and a negative ion when you take them off the shelf in the jar, right? Typically, again, very, very rare instance where you might want both halves, right? Typically, you want one of the ions the other one just comes along for the ride. And so it's usually intentional to the spectator. And so it just kind of sort of gets in the way if I don't dissociate my salt, right? And so in this particular case, as in most of these cases, my goal up front is really to identify what the compounds are. That tells me basically what's going on Right. In this case, you know, it says pH, which tells me acid and base. On the other hand, if I go through and look at the compounds, identifying the compound also sort of tells me acid and base because ammonia, base, right, HCl, acid, right, and of course, ammonium chloride, salt, which, as we'll see shortly, really means acid and base, right? But what it definitely means is 
dissociate it because it is dissolved in water. And so there's two different pieces there. And so again, I have ammonium as the cation and chloride as the anion, right? This again is a classic spectator. Right. And of course, ammonium is the conjugate of ammonia. And so that's really my tell that there's a buffer here, right? Now, I either need to dilute all of my chemical components in the mixture, or at the very least, I need the moles, moles, moles until I get them all sorted out, right? If you read the rest of the words, I have a 500 milliliter solution, I add 10 milliliters to it, right? Another one of my sayings is if I mix two solutions, I dilute them both. And so my concentrations are not what I see in the original problem, they've been diluted, right? Since it's a buffer and I wanna use Henderson Hasselbeck, I don't necessarily need molarity, right? And to avoid the dilution problem, at least for now, right, I can deal in moles, moles, moles. And so again, units, 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 <clears throat> molarity is moles per liter. So of course, if I have half a liter, right, my concentration is essentially a conversion factor. Right. And so I start with 0 0.0615 moles of ammonia. Right. At the bottom, I have added to it 0 0.00567 moles of HCl. And again, because I dissociated my ammonium chloride and it's a one-to-one -one salt, I have 0.1625 moles of ammonium as well as 0.1625 moles of chloride. Right. If I want to play the brute force game, right, I have water in both categories always. Right. Ammonium is an acid, ammonia is a base. HCl is in fact a strong acid. Cl minus is technically a base. It's negatively charged. And so I technically have three acids and three bases. And so there are nine possible acid base reactions that could be happening, All right? For reasons that will be clearer hopefully by the end of class, Right, because chloride is a classic spectator, I can ignore it and its three reactions. That still technically gives me six reactions I could do. Right, and as I was saying last week, right, if I write them all down and list the case, I can find the order in which I want to solve them, right? Short of doing that, however, I can always tell what the first reaction is, right? Because the biggest K is going to be the biggest Ka with the biggest Kb, right? Because again, the generic sort of acid base K is the Ka of the acid times the Kb of the base over Kw. All right, and so the one that's going to have the net biggest K is always the biggest Ka with the biggest Kb, right? On the base side, right, ammonia is the biggest. And of course, since HCl is a strong acid, right, it is the biggest acid, right? And so my first reaction is, in fact, right, HCl with ammonia. And in fact, as we'll see in mere seconds, since HCl 
is limiting in that reaction, right? That is the only HCl reaction I can do, right? Which is why my second reaction is ultimately the KB of ammonia, right? And so if I, again, if I recognize that up front, I can essentially icicle it, right? Again, some people hate this double ice chart. And so I can do it as two separate ice charts, which I think frankly is clearer in terms of what the two reactions are since that first reaction is kind of hidden in the double ice chart, right? But the biggest K by far, it's super freaking big is the ammonia with the HCl. <clears throat> right, like all acid base reactions, it's one to one to one to one, right? And because the HCl is in the lowest quantity, right? It is the limiting reagent. And again, that sort of zero in the equilibrium line is the characteristic of a limiting reagent. All right, and so after that first reaction, I'm out of HCl, right? And again, all it's done is essentially change the relative amounts of the conjugate pair. There's now slightly less ammonia than there was at the very beginning and there's slightly more ammonium, right? If I care for completeness, there's also slightly more chloride, but since I've already stated without proof yet that the chloride is a spectator, I don't really care about that, right? And the second biggest K is the KB reaction of ammonia, which of course is also my buffer reaction. Right, and as is always the case with these mixtures of acids and bases, my second reaction simply starts where the first one ends, right? And so my final amount from the first equilibrium become the initial amounts in the second equilibrium. This is of course a buffer. If I recognize that, I can henderson hasselbeck If I don't, I can plug it into K and solve it. Although again, if I'm going to use K, right, I'm gonna to have to convert my moles back to molarity. Right. On the other hand, right, henderson hasselbeck allows me to use moles directly, which was the reason I chose to do my ice charts and moles in the first place. Right. And so again, um, you can do this one of two ways, right? Either you can calculate the PKA from the PKB, or you can do what we did last week, which is to calculate the POH and then get the pH from that. They're exactly equivalent. It just kind of depends on where I put KW. All right, and so again, henderson hasselbeck only works because the assumption that X is small, it works, which allows me to use the initial amounts of the conjugate acid-base pair. All right. And so the pKa of technically ammonium is 9.26 and my moles are as indicated in the ice chart and if I do that I have a pH of Yes, no, maybe.
Now, it's worth pointing out something you may or may not have noticed at this point, which is that the solution um, to my buffer problem is not unique. Right. So, for example, for my ammonia ammonium buffer, right, my pH is always. the pKa plus the log of the ratio of the base to the acid, which in this case, ammonia is the base and ammonium is the acid, right? Well, if you think about it, right? I mean, suppose my ammonia is one molar and my ammonium is one molar, right? Well, then my pH is 9.26 plus the log of one over one, which is, one and the log of one is zero. And so the pH is 9.26. This, by the way, is called a balanced buffer, right? If these are equal, right? If the conjugate pair have equal amounts, the pH is always just the pKa. I bring that up because, of course, if you think about it, right, every time the ammonia ammonium amounts are equal, I'm going to get the same pH, 9.26. Right, even if there's very little of each of them. Right, this is true even of an unbalanced buffer. Right, if I have twice as much ammonium as ammonia, I get the same pH regardless of what the actual numbers are. So if I have two to one or 0.2 to 0.1, right? Or 0.0002 to 0.0001, right? The ratio in the log ends up being the same and the pH of the buffer ends up being the same, right? And so my buffers are not unique based on pH. Right. And effectively, what that means is all buffers of a particular pH are not created equal. Right. Because if I have ammonia and ammonium and I add HCl, for example, Right, we saw what happened in the last problem with the HCl. I get this super freaking big K neutralization reaction. Where the HCl was the limiting reactant and it, the net effect was that it decreased the amount of ammonia and increased the amount of ammonium, right? And so if I have, right, this extra acid, the pH essentially right, gets calculated from the new ratio of ammonia and ammonium, where the amount of ammonia has been decreased by the amount of HCl that, dare I say, neutralized it. And the amount of ammonium has been increased because ammonium is what I get, right, when HCl reacts with ammonia. B 
because HCl is a strong acid and you cannot have a buffer with a strong acid in the Essentially, yes. More on that in 10 minutes. All right now, I bring that up because, of course, if you think of that in terms of my different equivalent buffers, right? So all of these buffers are initially 9.26. Right. But if I add a little bit of HCl, right, the HCl decreases the ammonia and increases the ammonium. Right. Obviously, the effect of that little bit of acid is different for my three different 9.26 buffers. Right. Technically, none of them are 9.26 anymore, although two of them are awfully, awfully close. Right. Because this is now 0 0.000, 0 whoops, 0 0 0.009 over 0 0.1000. 0 0 one, right, it's pretty close to a one-to-one -one ratio still. This is even closer. This one has completely changed, right? It's now 0 0.00001 over 0 0.00003, right? It went from being one-to-one -to, -one to one to three, right? And so the effect of the exact same amount of HCl on those three different 9.26 buffers is radically different. Right. In fact, in two cases, my buffer very effectively eats that little bit of acid. Right. On the other hand, down here, my buffer does not have the ability to eat all of that acid. In fact, the pH changes quite a bit. In a word, this is referred to as the capacity of the buffer. And so because of this non-unique nature of the pH, it is not sufficient in specifying a buffer or to simply specify the pH. Right. Because the pH is not unique, Any identical acid-base ratio gives me exactly the same pH, but because that can be achieved by different um, amounts of acid and base, my buffer capacity is different. And so if I'm going to specify if I'm going to specify my buffer accurately, I need to specify the nominal pH because again, the whole point in having a buffer is because you want to maintain the pH, so there's always some target value I'm trying to hold, right? For blood it's like 7.4 ish. Right. But different buffers have a different capacity based essentially on how much of the conjugate acid base pair are present. Right. And so this thing called buffer capacity 
tells me how easy it is to move the pH off of the nominal value, right? This again is one of those things that's a little um, context dependent, right? For industrial applications, the general rule of thumb is one pH unit, right? If you're talking biological, that's too broad. A range, right? Blood pH generally runs between 7.35 and 7.45, assuming you're not sick with either acidosis or alkalosis, right? Which means for blood, right? Plus or minus one is ridiculous. You're dead at 6.35 if you don't fix that in a hurry, right? And so for the biological, you know, capacity, it's more like plus or minus 0 0.05 pH units. Right. That said, right, under either definition, whichever buffer has the bigger capacity will also have the bigger capacity for the smaller range because it's really a measure of how much total acid and base are in the system, right? And so if I have a nominal pH four buffer, right? I want the pH to be four. I consider it to still be buffered, right? If the pH remains between three and five, below three or above five, I consider myself now to be unbuffered, right? And so you can calculate the buffer capacity by essentially doing the reverse calculation of what we just did with the HCL, right? I still have a buffer, which again, has to be a weak acid or base with its conjugate. And then I'm just gonna throw some representative strong acid or strong base into the buffer to see what happens. To that end, right, Henderson Hasselbeck is my friend. Right, as is this ability to use moles instead of molarity. Right, it saves me a whole lot of diluting. <clears throat> and so if I make a buffer by mixing acetic acid with a salt containing this conjugate, because again, first thing I do with the salt is dissociate it. So it's sodium ion and there's my friend acetate, which is the conjugate of acetic acid. Right. That specific buffer, right, really needs to have three numbers specified to tell the user what its use is, right? There's the nominal pH of the buffer, and then there's the buffer capacity, which is different depending on whether I add acid or base. Right, and so the straight buffer capacity with Henderson Hasselbeck is painfully simple, right? It's the pKa plus the ratio of the base, which in this case is acetate, to the acid, which is acetic acid, right? And so the nominal pH of my buffer is 5.04, right? And so I consider my buffer to stay buffered, again, at least in an industrial application, as long as the pH stays between 4.04 .04 and 6.04, .04, right? One pH unit below my nominal and one pH unit above, right? And so the capacity is the amount of acid it takes to get me to 4.04 .04, or the amount of base it takes me to get to 6.04. And I threw HCl in here just to have a specific acid, but in fact, any acid will work. Right? 
because if I add an extra acid, I'm going to get a K neutralization that didn't exist before, which is going to be fricking bigger, bigger. So it's going to go first. And so, right, that extraneous acid is going to do what my HCl did in the previous example, right? It increases the amount of the conjugate acid that's present and it decreases the amount of the conjugate base that's present because that K neutralization is turning the base into the acid, right? In this case, right, it's turning my acetate into acetic acid. And so again, there's two ice charts I could write, right? Or there's one double ice chart I could write, but the net effect is, right, the HCl that I added decreases the amount of acetate and increases the amount of acetic acid. By how much? That's what I'm trying to figure out, right? Because my real question here is how much to get to a target pH as opposed to my previous question was, if I add a little bit of HCl, what's the pH, All right? And so my unknown here is actually the amount of HCl, right? In the context of henderson hasselbeck right? The amount of HCl is just X less acetate and X more acetic acid, right? In the end of my effective buffer region, is a pH of 4.04, .04, right? That's my target. And so kind of the opposite question is the one we've been solving, right? But with henderson hasselbeck other than the nasty log in there, it's still one equation, one unknown. And so if I subtract 4.74 from both sides, I isolate the log on one side, and of course the anti-LOG is 10 to the power of X. And so if I essentially raise both sides of this as a power of 10, the log gets canceled, and 10 to the minus 0.7 is just a number, 0.1995. And so, I can cross multiply and solve for X, right? And what I find is, right, my buffer will stay in range right, until I've added 0 0.206 moles of whatever my acid is, right? Essentially, that's the amount of acid my buffer can effectively eat while staying buffered. <clears throat> Because of course, it's gonna be somewhat volume dependent, right? A swimming pool can eat a lot more acid than a thimble, a thimble, right? My buffer capacity is usually expressed in terms of molarity, not moles, right? And so if you refer back to the original problem, right? My total volume of this buffer was 750 milliliters, which is where my 750 milliliters came from here. And so that 750 milliliters of buffer could eat 0 0.206 moles before all um, the buffer capacity was lost, which is effectively 0.275 molar acid, right? And so this is effectively the acid buffer capacity, right? The base capacity will generally speaking be a different number, right? Because the amount of acid, the amount of base was different when I started, right? But it's still the same question, just with a different target pH. In this case, I'm adding base, the pH is gonna go up, Right, and since again, my nominal pH was 5.04, I stay buffered until I get to 6.04, right? In this case, I'm adding a base, right? Say NaOH, right? And of course, adding the base, right? 
will decrease the amount of acid right, and increase the amount of base. And so now it's base in the numerator, right? So the acetate's going up by the amount of sodium hydroxide added, right? While the acetic acid is going down. Right. Other than that, it's the exact same problem we had before. Right. Subtract 4.74 from both sides, that isolates the log, 10 to the power of X gets rid of the log, cross multiply and collect the X terms. Right. And so I get again a number in moles since my whole <clears throat> Henderson Hasselbeck was constructed in moles. And so again, I consider myself to still be buffered on the base side until I've added a maximum of 0.1 moles of base. Because that's again volume dependent, right? It's better to report that as a molarity than a moles, right? 0 0.1 moles will do a whole different thing to a swimming pool than my 750 milliliters. And so the base buffer capacity, right? is 0.133 molar, right? And so if I were to fully specify my buffer, right, in this particular case, right, it was a nominal five point zero four pH buffer with an acid capacity of point two seven five molar and a base capacity of 0.133 molar, All right? And so to specify completely that buffer, I really need all three numbers. Yes, no, maybe, sir. What are you saying? This? So I'm not, why can I? Even though what? Well, it's because it's this reaction. Right, remember, this reaction is super freaking big. This goes first, right? So essentially I have X of this, I had whatever of this, I forget the number, point whatever, point whatever. This is a limiting reagent problem where this goes to zero. So this is minus X, this is plus X. And so the initial amount of acetate is decreased by X and the amount of acetic acid has increased by X. I'm not adding the HCl to the acetic acid. I've made more acetic acid because the HCl reacted with the acetate, right? As I say, that's why a lot of times two ice charts is better than one. This is the top, if you look at my labeling, of a double ice chart, right, where this top part is the separate reaction, right? This reaction is the buffer reaction, right, which is really the bottom part of the ice chart if I were to solve the whole thing. All right, and again, same thing here, right? Essentially, I'm adding X of this to whatever I had, point 
0.125 and 0.250, this thing is super freaking big. This goes to zero. All right, and so my initial amount of the conjugate acid base pair in the actual buffer reaction have gone up or down by the corresponding amount of the base I added. All right, it's essentially a two and a half. <laughs> it's essentially a two and a half reaction problem, right? I mean, there's only two reactions I'm solving, but of course, there's always KW that I might need in the background. Yes, no, maybe. Again, I highly recommend not being a student and instead thinking. <laughs> Sounds horrible when I say it that way, right? Because again, right, what you're going to ultimately do in one of these problems depends on what you have and what's going on. You can easily trick yourself into false pattern matching, right? That's why, you know, students are always telling me on the sprint reflections, we need more sample problems. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> Because, you know, part of the student strategy there is if you see enough sample problems, you can always find one that matches the problem you have, right? The problem is I could easily, if I were prone to want to fool you, right, by giving you something that structurally looks similar but isn't the same problem because you're matching a structure, right, not actually thinking about what the question's asking. And so, you know, if I have a single acid or a single base in water, it's a straight KA or KB problem, right? If I start mixing things together, right, what happens depends on what I mix together, right? This is not a buffer, right? This is not even a neutralization, right? And so you can easily be fooled by the structure of the problem if you start looking for structures without just thinking about what you have. So I stand by my basic method, identify what you have, list the acids, list the bases, react them all, let K sort them out, right? HClO, what kind of compound is this? It's an acid, how do you know? It's what? It's got a proton. It's also, if there's any doubt, look up the KA or the KB. If it has a KA, it's an acid. If it has a KB, it's a base. Acetic acid, our old friend, is of course an acid, right? This is a two acid problem. Those two compounds do not react, even though every fiber of your student being wants to make them react because why would I mix two things together if I didn't want you to react them, All right? But again, right, I've got what I've got and I'm in water, so I've already got an acid in the base and I just happen to have two acids. And so essentially, I have three acid base reactions I could do all of which are really KAs because the only base I have is water, right? And so biggest K first, right? This is 10 to the minus 14. This is 10 to the minus five. This is, I don't know. Let's say it's 10 to the minus four just because I want to do it first, right? So this goes first, followed by this, followed by water if I need it. Right. And so I have essentially no, I keep saying I hate the word, but I keep using it. I have no neutralization reactions going on at all. I just have three acids, each of which gives me a little more hydronium. Right. But that's okay. I don't need to be biased by any particular methodology this way. Right. It's every acid with every base. Let the K's decide which one to solve first. Right. On the other hand, right, here's a mixture. Again, they do not really react with each other.
right? I first and foremost dissociate the salt, right? I then actually have again water on both columns, right? But I now have ammonium as an acid and technically ammonia and chloride, which again I want to ignore for reasons I'm clearly not going to get to today. Right. But I essentially have four possible reactions. Right. The only one of which that really matters is the NH3, right, KB, which is why this ends up being a buffer. Right. Technically, right, ammonium plus ammonia has the biggest K. Right. But as we said last week, that doesn't change the concentration of anything. The next biggest K, right? And that's where my ammonium really pops up, not as something for the ammonia to react with, so much as it is the conjugate of ammonium, and it's an initial amount of the conjugate in the KB reaction or in a word, a buffer. But I can solve that whole problem without ever knowing it's a buffer, <clears throat> right? Every acid with every base, let the K sort them out, right? And, you know, same thing here. Again, part of you either wants to react them or if you're thinking buffer, part of you wants to make them a buffer, it's really not. Right, ammonia is a base, right? Technically, ammonium or ammonium, sodium is an acid, but again, as we were saying last week, it's a classic spectator, which apparently we'll finally get around to discussing in gory detail on Wednesday, right? And acetate is a base, right? In fact, this is similar to my three acid problem, this is a three base problem, right? I have ammonia with water, acetate with water, and if I need it, water with water, right? The biggest K is the ammonia. So again, it's the ammonia reaction first. I may or may not need the acetate at all, right? Again, it's a case where there's a big difference in Ks, right? But I solved the ammonia first, I solved the acetate secondly, Hope, hopefully the acetate doesn't add much and I'm done, right? And so again, I don't so much have to recognize the problem up front and try to fit into a prepackaged solution. That's why I kind of warn against the internet because it'll give you all these useful, and they do work, useful little algebraic expressions to solve a particular type of problem, but that forces me to try to categorize the problem up front, which you could do, right? On the other hand, I don't have to, right? I dissociate all my salts, I look at all, list all my acids, all my bases, cross them all, and let the K tell me what order to do the reactions in. As easy as Henderson Hasselbeck makes my life for a buffer, I never need to use it. Right, because Henderson Hasselbeck is, after all, just solving the K equation anyway. Right. Questions, problems? Finally, salts on Wednesday, although we've been talking about salts on and off for a week anyway. Um, I may migrate my office hours since mornings don't seem to be good for a lot of people in the project. So I might trade some of the mornings for evenings or I might just add evenings. So check your email for changes. Um, and please, please, please look at that before the last minute. 